Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. We will now begin our webinar. My name is Kathy Bernard, and I am the founder and president of the Save Your Skin Foundation. Tonight's webinar, Behind the Lens of Ocular Melanoma, Dr. Butler's Insights, we will shed light on the latest developments and advancements in the realm of ocular melanoma. This melanoma is a rare and challenging cancer that requires increased awareness, a supportive community, and improve treatment options for those affected. Before we jump into today's presentation, I would like to tell you about Save Your Skin and about myself. Uh, most of you know my story. I was diagnosed in 2003 with stage four uh, malignant metastasized melanoma. By the time I had established Save Your Skin in 2006, my cancer had spread to my vital organs and my treatment options were limited. I had to hop, step, and jump through treatments to finally get to the first innovative treatment in 2007 that would ultimately get me here today. This year marks my 20th anniversary since my battle with cancer. And while my cancer treatments have finished, the battle with melanoma for me is never over. Here at Save Your Skin Foundation, we are a patient-led organization dedicated to the fight against non-melanoma skin cancers, melanoma, and ocular melanoma through education, advocacy, and awareness initiatives across Canada. Save Your Skin provides a community of oncology patient and caregiver support throughout the entire continuum of care, from prevention and diagnosis to survivorship. Now, a little bit more about Ocumel Canada and why today's uh, webinar is so important. Ocumel Canada is an initiative of Save Your Skin and it was formed to increase awareness of advanced treatment options and build a supportive community for those diagnosed with primary and or metastatic ocular melanoma. Ocumel, no, Ocumel Canada is in close collaboration with a global medical advisory board and partner patient representative organizations with the endeavor to build on international best practices to improve patient outcomes for Canadians touched by this disease. Now, it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marcus Butler, who will be presenting his insights from the latest innovations happening in the OM space. Please note there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Dr. Butler is a medical oncologist and the Medical Oncology Melanoma and Skin Oncology Site Lead at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. He is a physician investigator with an interest in the translational development of immune-based therapies for cancer patients. He received his MD from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and trained in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, and hematology oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. After serving on the Dana-Farber staff, he joined the Department of Medical Ontology medical oncology and hematology at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in 2012. Dr. Butler is a medical oncology disease site lead for melanoma skin cancers at Princess Margaret and is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the clinical director for the immune monitoring team at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center where he focuses on the immunological impact of anti-cancer immunotherapies. Dr. Butler has been a great resource and a great friend to Save Your Skin for many years, and we are so pleased that he is the co-lead of the Ocular Melanoma Physician Task Force of Canada. Dr. Butler, over to you. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and you know, th thank you. It's an honor to be given the opportunity to uh, to talk with all of you um, and to review some recent uh, insights in uh, 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 uveal melanoma in particular. Most of this uh, talk will focus on, um, on uveal melanoma, which is the most common type of ocular uh, uh, cancer um, uh, that, that uh, exists. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully, yes, good. Here are my disclosures. 
so the objectives are to uh, discuss uh, in detail the management of primary and metastatic uveal melanoma uh, and to review how uh, management of metastatic disease is evolving, as well as discuss uh, current and uh, uh, future clinical trial options. <clears throat> so uveal melanoma is uh, termed uveal melanoma based on the fact that it arises from the uveal tract, which is a uh, part of the eye that uh, has pigmented cells that involve the iris, where you see the color in your eye, the ciliary body that helps to increase and, and decrease the size of the pupil, and the choroid, which sits right behind the retina. Uh, uveal melanoma is a rare cancer. Only three to six per million patients uh, uh, develop this type of cancer. It's a very atypical type of melanoma in that there's no uh, effect of sunlight uh, to cause uh, the, this type of melanoma, and it doesn't have a large number of mutations present. Uveal melanoma is also unique in that the types of mutations that are present in uh, this cancer are very different than skin melanoma. Most, uh, more than 90% of patients will have a mutation in, in uh, one of the G proteins, either GNAQ or GNA11. Uh, other mutations arise over time when a uveal melanoma develops and these mutations allow the uveal melanoma to grow, uh, proliferate, and in some patients spread to other organs. The, uh, in this slide, we show the three main types of uveal melanoma, uveal melanoma involving the iris, which is the least common, uveal melanoma involving the ciliary body, and uveal melanoma in the choroid. Uh, when you have a uveal melanoma that involves a ciliary body, that puts you at a little bit higher risk of recurrence. Uh, and the iris melanomas are actually the, the best ones to have, probably because they're picked up earlier, because when you look at someone, you can see that there's something going on in their eye. Uh, the slide here on the first line shows the founder mutations, the most common mutations, GNAQ and GNA11, and then the less common mutations, cis ladder and PLCB4, which are associated with this type of melanoma and are involved in uh, protein kinase C uh, signaling pathway. The second hit mutations are down below, and these mutations are mutations that are often found <clears throat> and are associated with uh, aggressiveness of the cancer, with BAP1 being the most aggressive uh, uh, SF3B1, a little bit less aggressive, but patients will uh, develop metastasis, and EIF1AX is the least aggressive mutation. So the best treatment for or one of the, the, there are many options for therapy for uveal melanoma, uh, but the, uh, uh, for patients who have relatively small uh, tumors, or medium-sized tumors, plaque brachytherapy is often the preferred treatment. This involves direct um, uh, placement of a radioactive plaque next to the tumor. Radiation is provided to the tumor uh, site, and it kills all of the cells uh, that are present. And it's extremely effective at controlling uh, uh, the disease 95% of patients have no evidence of recurrence in the eye at five years. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, sorry. Great. Other types of treatment include radiation therapy that's provided uh, uh, outside of the eye uh, to area. Sometimes patients are, require external beam radiation due to the uh, geometry of where the, the tumor is. Other times, that uh, when, the, when the tumor is too large, a nucleation is the best option where the, the eye is removed. And this is also a highly successful method, but unfortunately results in loss of vision from the eye where you've had an enucleation. 
There are different strategies for identifying patients who are at high risk of recurrence. Uh, and in this case, when I say recurrence, because 95% of the time, the eye is completely uh, cured without any recurrence. What I'm referring to is the development of metastasis. So when you treat the eye, uh, after that week of plaque brachytherapy or the treatments with radiation, the tumor cells are dead. They're not able to grow and spread. Uh, often the ocular oncologist will say, well, there's a tumor there and it's shrinking, but it's still there. What's happening is that these dead cells don't completely die. They're just destined to die and they're not able to spread. But what's happened in patients who develop metastasis or spread or recurrence, what's happened here is that before the procedure is done, some cells are able to leave the eye and go to other parts of the body. And this can occur rarely in small tumors, but more commonly in, in large tumors. And unfortunately, the risk for relapse, while it's highest in the first five years, does not completely go to zero uh, relapses after five years. And there's a risk of having continuous relapse after the original uh, uh, five years have finished. So we continue to monitor patients for much longer than we will often uh, monitor patients with breast cancer or even melanoma where the risk of relapse beyond five years is quite low. When you add all of this up, uh, the statistics show that around 30 to 50% of patients may develop distant disease. These numbers are a bit unclear. Certainly in the modern era where very small tumors are treated, the numbers are actually less than 30%, but there's some discussion of whether freckles are sometimes being overcalled as a, as a metastatic, as a sort of uveal melanoma, but that's an area to discuss with your physician uh, oncologist to see whether, you know, how sure they are of the tumor. Um, now, the interesting thing about this cancer is it loves to go to the liver. That's the first site of metastasis to show up. 90% of patients who have development of metastatic disease will have liver involvement, and about half of those patients will have just the liver involved. And in the past, we've had very few options for therapy uh, where patients had a really high risk of dying of their disease if they present with metastatic uveal melanoma. Now, as you'll know, there are people who are always exceptions to uh, these, this rule, and uh, we need to try to learn from patients who are the survivors and try to understand why some people do particularly well. There are multiple ways of identifying how a patient with primary uveal melanoma might develop uh, metastatic disease and ways to stratify to find patients who are at higher risk versus other patients. Um, in the East, we, we tend to use cytogenetics, uh, which includes review of the patient's tumor chromosomes. Monosomy is three is associated with a high risk. Uh, BAP1 mutation is, is associated with a high risk and larger tumors are associated with high risk. The smaller uh, tumors, who do not have evidence of monosomy 3 or 8Q gain are at much lower risk of, of uh, developing metastatic disease. This slide is a little bit outdated. Uh, some have recommended scans every three to four months. We found, especially after the time of COVID, that four to six months is perfectly fine for monitoring patients. We will follow patients for five years uh, uh, on this approach and then annually after that. There's also a test that's used a little bit more in the West Coast called the CASEL test or the Decision DXUM test. This uh, identifies patients that are at high risk based on a uh, gene expression profile. Class 1A are extremely low chance of recurrence, whereas Class 1B or Class 2 have a much higher risk of uh, relapse. And also expression of a molecule called PRAIM in the tumor can be as investigated to identify patients at higher risk. And what this does is it actually allows you to identify patients who you may want to monitor more intensively uh, uh, due to a higher risk of developing recurrence. 
with more aggressive disease, whereas you can uh, monitor patients uh, with less frequent scans uh, and uh, uh, who have uh, lower risk disease. The majority of patients, as I mentioned, uh, develop disease that's in the liver. Uh, cancer in the liver is often very difficult to identify based on symptoms because the liver can hide symptoms. And therefore, in our practice, we use MRI and ultrasound to identify tumors in the liver. And we can really focus on the liver as the primary area for monitoring patients. However, we will use CT scan, especially if a patient has a new symptom that needs to be uh, uh, reviewed. There is some discussion about PET scans and its utility. It's not uncommon for uvea melanoma to not be as active on PET scan. So we don't routinely use PET scan in our practice for uh, surveillance. Um, however, it can be uh, useful in certain circumstances. In terms of the old days and our survival, once patients develop metastatic disease, it was quite depressing where a very high percentage of patients passed away within a couple of years of uh, diagnosis of metastatic disease. However, uh, these statistics are improving with development of new therapies. The types of therapies that are available for patients currently include liver-directed therapy, either uh, something called radiofrequency ablation, where you can microwave a tumor out, uh, surgery, or infusing the liver with either radiate, radioactive bean beads or chemotherapy. Tibentafosp is a new bispecific agent that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Immunotherapy with checkpoint blockade is an effective way of treating patients. Chemotherapy is a still in our back pocket is a treatment option for patients as well as clinical trial and monitoring patients and providing pain and symptom relief as appropriate. In terms of liver-directed therapy, um, there is definite good evidence that treatment can benefit a select number of patients, especially if their disease is located solely in the liver. Um, there is some discussion about patients who have disease outside of the liver and whether or not liver-directed therapy is effective. It may be helpful to uh, uh, in patients where the bulk of the tumor is in the liver, but if there is additional disease outside of the liver, we need to be careful to make sure that we're treating all of the cancer and not just the liver. In terms of systemic therapies, uh, the the Tibentafosp is an agent that recently in the last couple of years was approved by um, Health Canada as well as the US and European agencies. It's a first in class novel agent. It's the first drug ever to show a survival benefit for patients with, mel with uveal melanoma. And the data supporting its use is strongest in the first line setting. Um, it's uh, also an important uh, treatment to have, be aware of uh, for uh, all physicians that are treating patients with uveal melanoma uh, because it is challenging to assess uh, this um, uh, drug and its benefit. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. It's also important that patients are able to review all treatment options. And also, um, uh, unfortunately, it uh, has a requirement for HLA testing so that 40 to 50% of patients are candidates for this treatment as opposed to the majority. So the way this drug works is it's based on the concept that tumor antigens are presented uh, uh, within uh, by cells. Uh, tumor antigens are unique molecules that are found on the tumor, but not on other cells. Um, and there are some tumor antigens that are restricted to certain uh, particular uh, cell lineages, um, such as skin cells or melanin-containing uh, melanin cells. And that's the case for Tibentafus, which, which recognizes the molecule called GP100. GP100 is processed by the cell's engine, you know, its, its internal guts will chop up the uh, GP100 and place peptides onto a, 
uh, HLA molecule, the HLA molecule then goes to the cell surface and the immune system can recognize uh, 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 the, uh, this uh, peptide. For patients, and uh, on this, you have the tumor cell at the top. It's presenting the GP100 peptide and HLA. And then what Tibentafus does is it recognizes this peptide in the HLA groove. And then it links up with T cells and activates T cells through the T cell receptor, which is called CD3. So this unique agent is able to do what a regular T cell response does, but it uses a molecule that's infused as a treatment to then bring T cells to target the cancer. There were uh, two different trials that were performed. One was a phase one study with 127 patients, another a phase two, phase three uh, study, which looked at um, over 300 patients, randomizing patients between Tibentafus and investigator choice. Um, this is a slide that shows that it was active in terms of inducing cytokines, and it also brought T cells into the tumor microenvironment. There are some side effects with tibentafusp. Uh, for the patients on the call who've experienced this uh, um, uh, treatment, it can, in many cases, be quite bumpy at the beginning where you have fevers, rash, sometimes low blood pressure, nausea and vomiting can occur. Uh, but these symptoms, which are initially severe at the beginning, can decrease over time so that we have less intense uh, side effects over time. The other thing that happens is these T cells drop, sorry, the, yeah, the T cells and lymphocytes in the peripheral blood uh, uh, decrease in the blood because they go into the tumor as a result of, of the treatment. And we found that in patients who have uh, at baseline very low uh, T cell presence in the tumor, it can increase the uh, T cells in patients as well as patients who have high or medium uh, baseline levels can increase. So in every patient, it seems to inflame or increase the um, uh, T cell activity within the tumor uh, 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 itself. Now, what was dis disappointing about this treatment is that the um, percentage of patients with responses was low. It was less than 10%, somewhere between 5 and 10% of patients will have shrinkage of tumor. In the phase two, these were patients who had had prior therapy um, and uh, the low response rate was disappointing, um, but we did notice that patients uh, did live longer than compared to historical controls. So this suggested that Tibentafus was active. Uh, the clinical trial for the phase three study um, randomized patients between Tibentafus and standard chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And in this study, we saw that patients had a much better survival compared to investigator choice. Uh, there is some discussion on whether it, uh, the investigator choice should have included combination ipilimumab and nivolumab. And there is some debate among oncologists on whether the combination immunotherapy would be just as good as tibentafus. In my book, that may be the case, but combination immunotherapy has a lot more side effects than, than tibentafus, so I'm still in favor of tibentafus, even over combination immunotherapy, and we're hoping that patients will continue to have access to uh, immunotherapy after tibentafus in the future. What's unique is that even in patients who have tumor growth, will still benefit in terms of overall survival. So this curve, the dark line, shows patients who had progression of disease, so growth of tumor, more than 20% on all of the scans. Still, these patients did better than patients who are on immunotherapy or, or uh, chemotherapy. Most of the patients received pembrolizumab in the study. So it does suggest that even in patients who have progression of disease, the uh, tibentafus is effective. And really the trick is to figure out how to identify patients who might benefit more 
and should continue on to the uh, versus other patients. Um, when we look at this type of plot, this is called a um, forest plot. You're identifying patients who seem to do better on, on tibentafusp. And what we did find is that patients with smaller tumors or patients with normal LDH tended to do better than patients who had larger tumors at baseline. Um, there's also some biologic evidence that suggests that um, the uh, mechanisms of resistance may have to do with uh, macrophages that are um, suppressive and could be involved in the uh, why some patients will have a progression of their disease. What, you know, as I mentioned, there's this issue with the with patients who have progression as their best overall response. So we have to figure out, well, who's the patient who should continue on treatment or switch to other therapy? And we're basically currently using uh, CT scans as the way to measure that. So patients who have a slowing in the growth of their tumor will continue on therapy, whereas patients who continue to grow despite treatment those are patients who will switch to other therapeutic options. I think the future does look bright for other types of, re of ways to identify patients. And this is a slide that shows that uh, many of the patients uh, can have reduction in their uh, circulating uh, DNA that's derived from the tumor and when we see a reduction in tumor, we see a improvement in survival, suggesting that ctDNA could be used as a surrogate. It's not quite ready for prime time, but it's definitely in development. And I think eventually we're going to be using this to help guide our therapy. So uh, Tebby is uh, very exciting for patients who have the right HLA match. Um, it's the best uh, option outside of the clinical trial for the HLA-A2 patients. Um, we have to treat patients with experience, uh, need to be under the treatment with experienced physicians because uh, interpreting the radiographic scans is a bit challenging. <clears throat> and I'll also mention that there is currently uh, a concept that's in the process of of, of being worked on where patients who have their eye diagnosis and before they've developed a recurrence, some patients may be eligible for participation in an adjuvant study. Uh, that's um, currently in development and soon to be uh, hopefully coming to Canada in collaboration with the European Cooperative Group, ERTC. In terms of what's next, there is a similar uh, drug, basically Tibentafusp's um, cousin. It targets a molecule called Prame. It's called FC106C. And what's unique about this particular study or this drug is that patients who had uveal melanoma and not yet received Tibentafusp, uh, there is a high response rate in a few patients and there's an expansion cohort being investigated. There's also cutaneous melanoma responses that are seen as well as even an ovarian cancer. And um, this is a trial that's been going on for quite a while as in a uh, later phase of expansion cohorts uh, and is hopefully about to be opened at Princess Margaret soon so that we'll be able to treat some patients. The challenge of this study is there are multiple cohorts and it's week by week, do we know whether there are slots for particular diagnoses? So at the time of assessment, we can see whether this is an appropriate study for patients. It's also uh, the frame study, uh, which has shown uh, these remarkable responses as shown here, um, uh, is also uh, going to be studied in cutaneous melanoma as a first line uh, uh, clinical trial um, that's also in development and soon to come to Canada. In terms of the PRAME, uh, early data suggests that these responses are not just temporary, but many of them can be durable, and we've observed uh, responses outside of uveal melanoma, so that's very exciting for this uh, treatment. In terms of immunotherapy, uh, standard immunotherapy, 
uh, that's used with great success in uh, uh, cutaneous melanoma, as Kathy Barnard uh, has pointed out through her own modeling. Um, the, it, this is a treatment approach that's been disappointing for many patients with uveal melanoma. However, there are exceptions. The idea here is that T cells can recognize antigens, which are these little starry things that are on the tumor. And the, one of the reasons why T cells will often not be able to uh, target the, the tumor is because of immune checkpoints. And in this case, uh, PD-1 or C2A4 are uh, molecules that prevent the action of the T cell. So if we block that um, response, we're able to see uh, better anti-cancer effects. There are different types of tumors that seem to be more poised to responding to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And uveal melanoma is an example of a cold tumor that often does not respond to treatment. When we look at the difference between skin melanoma and uveal melanoma, uveal melanoma is way off uh, on the side where it has few mutations and a low response rate uh, to therapy. It also has low PDL1 expression. Both of these are associated with, with responses to immune checkpoint inhibitors. There have been many studies looking at single agent uh, drugs like ipilimumab or, prim, or uh, pembrolizumab. Now, many of these studies were fairly low in numbers of patients, but the response rates were low in the five to 10% range. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab was investigated both by the Spanish and the um, uh, MD Anderson as well in North America. In the Spanish study, uh, response rate came out around 10% uh, of patients, and many of patients had durable responses. So, uh, and we've seen uh, durable responses with single agent anti PD1. It's just that they're a little bit higher uh, rate of responses with combination immunotherapy. And when we compare to historical controls, it looked very similar to that Tepentifus study where you see uh, Tebby looking better than, um, than uh, sorry, uh, Tebby looking better than historical controls and Ipinevo looks better than historical controls. When uh, similar analysis is performed looking at Ipinevo compared to Ventifos, but it looks like Tebi uh, works better, but uh, we do believe that ipilimumab and nivolumab can benefit many patients. In the MD Anderson study, the response rate was a little bit higher, about 20%, and the overall survival was improved uh, compared to historical controls. The biggest problem, however, with combination immunotherapy is the side effects. So if you think of it from this point of view, if 20% of your patients will benefit, but 70% of the patients have a severe side effect. That means you're more likely to have a severe side effect than benefit. There are other options that are being developed. Um, there have been some clinical trials um, uh, in the US that have suggested that Opdualag has a response rate around 10%, so a little bit higher than single agent, uh, but, uh, a, but a little bit, and maybe a little bit lower than ipinevo, but it, it's a promising uh, response rate with fewer side effects. And then there's also the possibility of other combination therapies to, uh, to treat patients um, uh, as opposed to the standard immune checkpoint inhibitors. <clears throat> So clinical trials are really needed to help us to understand how to improve the responses. One of the studies that uh, has uh, was recently uh, data was presented that showed really promising results is um, uh, a, 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 a drug called SD101, which is administered with a special type of catheter, which helps to infuse this um, uh, uh, immunotherapy directly into the liver, and then patients receive anti-PD-1 immunotherapy IV. Um, SD-101 is administered with a, a catheter called a, tri well, I'll call it a trisalis catheter, 
and this has resulted in improvements in in uh, inflaming the tumor, as you can see with all these multiple colors um, in a pre and post uh, tumor biopsy. Uh, patients have had drop in their um, uh, cell-free DNA as a result of uh, treatment uh, with SD101. And uh, this is a, a novel uh, approach that is um, uh, currently uh, uh, expanding into phase two, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have this uh, protocol up and running at Princess Margaret soon. Uh, currently, they are looking at previous uh, patients treated at different doses of drug, and it looks like the lower SD101 drug is more effective, so there's a pause in enrollment, so it probably won't be for another four to six months before we're able to put more patients on this particular study. Another uh, exciting uh, uh, approach is targeted therapy. Uh, the protein kinase C is a molecule which is um, activated uh, in patients with uh, GNA11 or GNAQ mutations. And if we inhibit protein kinase C, there is the possibility of having a reduction in tumor and reducing a growth of, of uh, tumor cells. Uh, there's also uh, much work that's looked at uh, uh, the MAP kinase uh, pathway, and many of you may have heard of a drug called selumetinib, which had a response rate of around 15%, um, and its cousin trametinib has a similar mode of action, but is something that could be considered for some patients. In terms of the selumetinib study, even though there was a low response rate in the clinical trial when compared to uh, chemotherapy, uh, its use was not effective. And therefore, there's been um, a focus on uh, 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 derovisertib, which is a protein kinase C inhibitor. In the early phase one study, there was a little hint of activity in patients uh, with a reduction in tumors uh, in about 30% of patients. The problem with this particular study is the durability, the responses was not very high. And uh, the uh, Novartis then decided to sell uh, Durovisertib, which was picked up by another company called IDEA. They uh, developed an assay where they looked at uh, uh, ways to possibly partner derovisertib with another drug uh, to make it more effective. And they landed on uh, a, a, a drug called crizotinib, which is uh, provided by a company called Pfizer, where these two companies have joined forces and are um, uh, doing uh, a clinical trial with a combination of derovisertib and crizotinib. So in uh, the phase two study, there's actually a quite high response rate of around 30 to 35% of patients with confirmed responses, many of them durable. In uh, our uh, clinical trial, we've also noted a high uh, response rate of at least 50% uh, patients with uh, shrinkage of tumor, uh, uh, significant shrinkage of tumor uh, so that we're quite excited about the possibility of this drug um, uh, helping patients. Um, and in the first line uh, setting, um, uh, patients have a high uh, response rate. Uh, recently at the uh, um, uh, European Oncology meeting, data was presented that showed that a uh, high percentage of patients have drops in their CA in their circulating tumor DNA, and that this was associated with better outcomes. So now a clinical trial that's just opened uh, and will be opening uh, at other centers in Canada, but it just did officially open in uh, Toronto, is comparing investigator choice. So either immunotherapy, single agent, or combination immunotherapy, uh, and comparing that to derovisertib and crizotinib. Uh, combination uh, uh, over uh, uh, the in a randomized study, 
so that two thirds of the patients will get uh, combination therapy, a third of patients will get the standard immunotherapy. What's also exciting is that uh, our uh, colleagues in Australia have done a clinical trial where patients who are destined to have their eyes removed uh, receive uh, Durova Sertib uh, to see whether it will shrink the cancer and possibly uh, uh, make it possible to preserve eyesight so that patients don't require a nucleation. Um, in that study, a small number of patients have been treated but uh, uh, there have been a high percentage of patients with shrinkage of tumor. You can see here this large tumor, that's this black thing here, has substantially reduced with uh, treatment. And there's one patient on that study who was able to uh, save their eye and not undergo uh, uh, an enucleation. This uh, 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 is very exciting and we do have a study that's about to open uh, where uh, patients with large tumors are either going, uh, have the option of having uh, the, um, uh, the, the treatment. Uh, if a patient would otherwise have an enucleation, we will treat with drug before the enucleation. If a patient is destined to have brachytherapy, but one of the issues with large tumors and brachytherapy is often the large dose of radiation requires that's required to treat the tumor results in later side effects. So if we, the hypothesis is if we shrink it, we can use less radiation and therefore uh, may allow those patients to have better uh, preserved eyesight. Um, this is a study which is um, uh, about to open up uh, patients will be monitored very closely with monthly exams and will have their uh, primary ther therapy earlier if necessary, or if they continue to benefit, will have their primary therapy at six months and then re uh, re receive additional treatment for six months uh, afterwards to try to see if we can not only reduce the risk of recurrence in the eye, but also reduce the uh, risk of metastasis to the liver and other sites. There's another type of therapy called TIL therapy. Uh, this is where we use cells to fight the cancer. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the concept of TIL therapy is where a tumor sample is procured. Uh, the tumor is then placed into um, a culture where uh, the T cells that are present within the tumor microenvironment are grown up uh, over time with additional cytokines, which are kind of you know, catnip for the, for the T cells. And then those T cells eliminate the tumor in the, in the specimen. The patient's uh, T cells are then uh, cryopreserved and then infused as a therapy to patients after preparative chemotherapy is given and patients also receive uh, a drug called IL-2 to try to induce a response. In an early phase two clinical trial performed at the National Cancer Institute in the US, there was uh, encouraging response rate uh, with uh, many patients with durable res uh, 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 responses. And there are patients uh, who uh, continue on this type of therapy. Um, which is really in the clinical trial uh, 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 setting at this time. Uh, within the Canadian environment, there uh, is a clinical trial that is coming soon. Uh, T-Bio 4101 is a specialized type of approach where tumor is harvested. It's then processed. Patients, um, are also undergo a procedure where uh, white cells are removed from the blood and then the rest of the blood returned and only a fraction of the, of the white cells uh, from the blood are used. Uh, and then everything else is given back to the patient. Uh, these uh, white cells are used to develop uh, dendritic cells, which are then decorated with antigens that are present in the patient's tumor. And then we're able to um, uh, stimulate the patient's T cells specifically so that we have 
a purified product that we can then use as a therapy. So it's the same concept of tumor harvest, lipodepletion, and cell infusion. But in this particular study, uh, patients will require an apheresis so that we can make a better T cell product. And all of these patients receive anti PD1 therapy afterwards. So, in summary, uh, primary treatment of uveal melanoma uh, is highly successful. 95% of patients have all of their cancer uh, taken care of uh, in the eye. The, uh, I think there is more work that's required because. Many of our patients still need, require enucleation for, for treatment, and the larger tumors often have a larger um, a requirement for um, the plaque brachytherapy and will end up with side effects from the plaque. So if we can make the tumor smaller, perhaps we can improve the outcomes for patients. Now, while metastat, and more importantly, the real sort of exciting thing is that we have adjuvant and neoadjuvant approaches for patients, which we haven't had in Canada for several years. Um, and there will be hopefully soon a Tibentifus study. That's going to be several months off. And we're about to start for the really high risk patients, uh, Durovisertib uh, study. In terms of metastatic disease, this is a life just, uh, changing diagnosis, but we have treatment options. Many of the standard therapies can give patients long-term benefit. There is more work that's needed. Clinical trials give us a lot of hope. Um, there are several studies that are uh, uh, open or about to open, and additional things are coming uh, down the pike with a lot of promise. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Butler. Um, we're going to now open the floor to questions um, from uh, the group. Uh, just a reminder, you can type it into the Q&A feature, or you can also put it into the chat. I think I have both up. And I've got uh, Jasmine here to help me if I become not techie savvy. Okay, we got lots of questions coming in. Um, so for, now, yeah, for Giovanni, I don't really know the answer. You'll have to ask one, an, an eye doctor, unfortunately, um, about the cataract um, uh, question. Um, and then it looks like there's, uh, you've got some help on that. Um, okay, so I'll let, go ahead. I'll, I'll run these through. Uh, so the first one is, do we have access to the Abdullah in Ontario? Yeah, so I've asked that question of um, um, of BMS, and they have an issue with getting the drug into country, and it's supposed to be January that it'll be in the country. So it's in the U.S., but they don't have drug supply in Canada. It has helped Canada approval, but it's not here yet. So even if um, you have private drug insurance, um, you probably won't be able to get it here, but if, um, or if you wanted to pay out of pocket and there won't be a compassion program right away, I'm told. I think that's still up in the air and it's, you know, uh, you know, I think in this in this case, it's where patient advocacy uh, sort of uh, knocks at the door of the drug company. And then if and, the, you know, and the work that you do, Kathy, where you're going to the drug company and you're saying, hey, we really want this. That's actually good ammunition because then they're able to go to their global, uh, you know, the global group which is really the decision maker and then say, hey, you know, there, there's a market in Canada, there's an interest by patients and then hopefully we can get that expedited. Perfect. Another one, do you need to be HLA positive for the PREM? Yeah, so treatment? that one you require HLA-A2. So the, basically the same patients who would be eligible for Tibentifus would be eligible for PREM. The the and and the patients who are not eligible for TEBI due to the HLA would not be eligible for PRAIN. Um, there 
And for the ocular group, that is a bit of a moving target because they're looking at a combination of tibentafusp and Prain. And that's a very exciting idea. Um, again, it's the same story. They treated a bunch of patients. They're looking at dosing. They're seeing how patients are doing. At, you know, at the time that you need to be treated, you have to look and decide whether there's, a, or, well, you have to, if you're waiting for a slot to open up, that may not be the best strategy. You want to treat small. So if you need treatment, review your options at that moment. If we think that there's going to be a slot in the next couple of weeks, fine. But if if there isn't going to be one, I would move on and go with your Tebby if, if, or other treatment if, if that's a better option for you. Oh, and I, can, I have to mention, for the first-line targeted therapy, the Durova Sertid study, it's only for patients who are A2 negative. So this is a scenario where if you're A2 positive, then you're going to want to get Tebby. If you're A2 negative, then you're going to if you're trying to be on a trial or something, you would want, you'll go on to the Durova Sertib study or immune checkpoint. Okay. Does the trisalis treatment depend on the HLA status? No, that doesn't. Okay. And, yep. And has the IDE196 Citro study started with you yet? Which one? The IDE196. Yep, that's the Durova Sertid. So the first line study is open and, and we're sending out consent forms now. The neoadjuvant study, there's some uh, logistics that need to be finished up with our ocular group, but then that'll be open. So that's very close to being open. Um, if you're a patient being seen by that group and that's something you're really interested in, then um, you know, we'll advocate to get those T's crossed and I's dotted. Um, the There was another question. Yeah, PMH will be running the TIL study, and it's, um, it's will be harvesting, you know, patients will have their tumor harvests in January, uh, and we're going to be having our site initiation visit in the next couple of weeks where we get all of the details got run through. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, clinical trials. And you'll probably know who this question's coming from. Well, I, can see, the, the, I can see yeah. my, my, my good friends and <laughs> yes. who's asking these questions. So it's great. <laughs> Perfect. So I don't have to rat anybody out. How and you and I have done this before. I'm pretty proud of the way we work through the Chebby file uh, behind the scenes. Um, but I think it's really important, you know, that we get these clinical trials across Canada. Um, you know, and I will, I'm writing my homework down here because I have a lot to do today too. Uh, because I'll be circling back with Dr. Smiley and John Walker in the next couple of days. Because as you know, for patients traveling, you know, from anywhere. Uh, to treatment is difficult enough because they're leaving their support system. So the quicker we can get them closer to home, uh, the better it is for all of us. Uh, so, uh, Nige, I have that with big stars on it. Uh, Dr. Butler, if you've got any, you know, inside information on how we can get them quicker across Canada, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is, this is, um, you know, obviously we want to have innovative, exciting new trials as well as things that are slam dunks and are definitely going to work. Um, it is hard to get, and, and these trials are expensive, it, even to open up one or two sites. In a population like Canada, which is it's not a it's not a tiny country. I mean, we're pretty big, but we're huge in terms of geography, and even and you know, unfortunately, we're all along a line as opposed to, you know, the population in one little circle. So patients still, even though, you know, most of the pay, most of the country is populated at the southern border, it's still um, it's still people are far distances. So, um, and the population is such that the distance is, is um, or it's hard to have 
too many sites with very low accrual, you need to have a certain sort of sweet spot. Um, when the company is really excited about a drug, uh, they're finding that Canadian patients are really great patients to work with. Um, we're, you know, the healthcare system is a little less expensive. We're able to do things. Um, you know, what we really need to do is make sure that the provinces understand the importance of clinical research because they often don't want to pay for anything that has to do with the cancer uh, sort of trial. You know, they only want to pay for standard of care. And if you create those types of of um, of uh, uh, obstacles, then it makes it harder for uh, companies to to come into Canada. So making sure that the the clinical sites that are doing trials do good quality work and have adequate resources, I think that might change things making sure that the companies know that there are patients that are interested in participating in studies. And then, you know, for the, you know, like we have an opportunity with the, this uh, drove assertive study is to have patients, um, you know, treated on this study. It's very exciting, I think. And, um, you know, if we can accrue well, then I think it'll allow us to, to be able to treat more patients. But, I think it's a combination of making sure we have the capacity and that requires government to, to not be allergic to having infrastructure for studies. Princess Margaret, it has an infrastructure, but a lot of it is due to all those donations that help us to create the, the, the infrastructure. And um, US has the advantage of cancer centers, which get government money to create the infrastructure and none of, we don't have a similar model in Canada, so that people, so that it's, it does, it actually gets less federal funds for clinical research. So anyway, politics I think is a part of it, and then also participation for creating good data, and then going from there. And you know, one of the reasons that the Durova Assertive study is being opened in in Alberta is because the. The sponsor knows that we have patients coming from Alberta and 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 uh, British Columbia to be on the study. So we basically remind the sponsors so that then they, when they want to do these studies and accrue quickly, they'll include these areas. Okay, the eligibility criteria for IMC F one hundred six C states a pram positive tumor. How does one know if their tumor is PRAM positive? Yeah, so it and, and there are different cohorts on that study. You know, the current cohorts do not include patients who've been on Tibentafos, but you know that's a moving target. It can always change. Uveal melanoma is has a the patients who develop high who had developed recurrent metastatic uveal melanoma are almost always PRAM positive. Um, and there's not that, because of that, there's not that requirement uh, for the ovarian cancer and uh, lung cancer and other tumors that's less common. So they end up being tested through it, through uh, it's an immunohistochemistry test. So it's a lab test where you look at the tumor and stain for, for PRAME. Um, is the DELCAF being considered for a trial in the future? Yeah, so that's a great question. I had a very nice conversation with the uh, DELCAF, uh, the guy from the company at DELCAF, and uh, he's he is intrigued by the idea of getting uh, DELCAF into Canada and sort of trying to figure out how to make that happen. It, and you know the the interesting thing about Delcap is that it's regulated in a way that's different than uh, systemic therapies because it's a procedure oriented uh, regulation, which I don't think Kathy you've been involved in before, so it's different. And I don't know all of the answers on this. I am it's on my to do list to talk to uh, Dr. Beecroft, our uh, a local on local uh, liver directed guru and others to see how we could possibly get this now it's not 
it's gone through FDA and EMA, the European agency has never gone through Health Canada. So we would have to make the case that there is a market here for them. Um, I think that one of the things that they're interested in doing is to have an investigator initiated study where we treat some patients here and then sort of get experience and, and maybe learn something about how this agent might be useful. Um, the advantage of Delcath, just briefly, I didn't really go into that in detail, is that as opposed to these infusions where you, or, or surgery or uh, microwave treatments where you're having to go specifically to the tumor, essentially what you do is you, Delcath is this machine, it perfuses the tumor, so it's basically kind of steeped in the chemotherapy, and then you remove the chemotherapy. And um, the advantage here is that even small tumors are able to be treated, whereas a lot of the infusions and embolizations require the tumor be of a sufficient size for that tr treatment approach to be useful. Um, we're, all, we're actually over time, but there's a couple I still want to ask if you're okay hanging on for a bit. Yeah, sure. um, how will patients be selected for the TILs? So uh, there, there are some requirements in terms of the number of lines of therapy that patients have had, and then uh, there's other eligibility uh, requirements and you know, to make sure that you'd be able to undergo the treatment. It's a pretty tough regimen that involves um, um, uh, the, uh, the chemotherapy and IL-2. So some patients may not be well enough for, for this approach, but others will be, and so we'll, we'll see. So it'll have a lot to do with what would be involved to do a tumor harvest. If it's too difficult an operation, then we'll favor patients who are a little bit easier. Uh, because we're not sure if this will be effective therapy. Um, you know, I think that if TIL is FDA approved uh, in the U.S., then there will be uh, many patients who may try to get out of country co coverage to go to the U.S. for a treatment, but it's not the sort of thing that you can easily import um, the way we do, uh, have done other compassion programs. So it um, that'll be a challenge um, if uh, if there's a if and when there's an FDA approval, and you know there are um, there are different groups within the U.S. that are looking at different approaches like this. Um, we'll, we'll we just have our study and we'll see what happens. Hey, I know a little bit about IL too, so I I understand why that's that's you know yeah, not, it's not everybody's cup of tea. No. Um, uh, one more we got here. If the Duravacertib crits versus investigators choice study is only for the HLA 0201 negative patients, do we have compassionate IDE 196 in Ontario? Um, it's not. Um, there was a compassionate program that, um, but it's been closed, unfortunately. Um, we have a few left, but I think what we'll do is they're around prevention and diet. So maybe um, Dr. Butler will kind of collect a few of the, the what's left okay. and maybe give you your evening back. Uh, I just want to reiterate what Nigel just put in the chat. You are amazing. Um, so we're now at the end of our webinar. And honestly, Dr. Butler, I can never thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule because all of us know how unbelievably busy you are. Um, for everybody on, please don't forget to visit the website and our Facebook group, which is uh, on the screen now. Uh, you'll be emailed the recording of the webinar once it becomes available. Um, and it'll be available on the website and the YouTube channel in the upcoming days. So that should be all. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Butler again. I can never thank you enough. Uh, and bye to everyone and have a good evening. Great. Thank you. And take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.